Good morning, everyone. We're very lucky today to have Dr. Vera Maranova, who will be talking to us about the human resources of non-state armed groups. Uh, my name is Dia Mohsen. I'm uh, an anal- a Middle East North Africa analyst in the Conflict Security and Development Program. Uh, Dr. Maranova is a visiting research fellow at... Uh, the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfast Center for Science and Security Studies, um, sorry, Center for Science and International Affairs, um, and her work broadly spans non state armed groups and their internal organization. She has actually been uh, embedded with the Iraqi Special Operations Force. Uh, forces, so her expertise is very uh, uh, unique. Um, she has commented uh, across a number of media outlets, including the New York Times, Foreign Policy, BBC, and the Boston Globe, and has uh, also provided commentary for AP and the Washington Post. So, with that, uh, Dr. Marinova. Thank you. So, let's proceed directly to the presentation. So, when I was doing my field work uh, in Syria, I was interviewing a lot of fighters, local and foreign fighters, and at the same time, for example, in 2015, we were conducting interviews with fighters of ISIS and Jihad al Nusra, which is basically, you know, more or less close to each other groups. And when we were interviewing fighter, a local fighter of Jihad al Nusra, they were so excited about foreign fighters. They were like, "Oh my God, we have foreign fighters with us. We are so lucky to have them. We love to go in battles with them." Great, we would not be that good without them. At the same time, basically, you know, 10 kilometers away in ISIS, local fighters were like, oh my god, like it was the worst decision of our leadership was to bring all those clowns from all over the world. They're destroying us. We should kick them out, get rid of them, and never think about them again. So my question was, why, at the same time, in the same region, in the same war, those two groups have that different opinion about foreign fighters. Because even like, you know, it's the same people, local fighters, all people from Syria, the same foreign fighters, you know, from the same basically countries and so on. How did it happen that they are, the experience, you know, varies that much? So that's the main question of of my presentation today, which is like part of my book. So what do we know in terms of research uh, about foreign fighters' labor market, you know, till now? We know a lot about uh, local fighters' labor market. Why they join, how they choose a particular group to join, why they quit and leave, and how to manage them, because it's another issue, right? What do we know about foreign fighters? Well, we just started learning about why they join. Uh, What about how they choose an armed group? What about when they quit? Because they do quit voluntarily. And the most important question here is how to manage them. So that's exactly what I'm trying to answer. So first, I'm uh, I'm looking at this issue through the labor market theory. So on one side, I'm looking at people, you know, who participate, actually foreign fighters, right? And their decision making why to join, uh, uh, to understand who these people are, why, what particular job they choose to do in an armed group, what particular armed group they wish to join, and so on. And on the other side, I'm looking at the armed group as an institution that benefits, you know, that could get some benefits from those people, but also, you know, what are the problems for the armed group from foreign fighters? And how do they work together? Basically, how to optimize the thing, how to get the most out of those guys with uh, minimizing the problems associated with that. Uh, this research is, ba- is based on a very extensive field work in Iraq, Syria, and uh, other countries. So I conducted surveys with 400 local fighters, including members of Jihad al-Nusra. I constructed a data set of HR policies of 40 armed groups in Syria, basically interviewing their leaders about I mean, HR, uh, like in any other organization that I interviewed, like uh, foreign fighters who were going to Syria, interviewed by phone people who were already fighting there, people who exited, um, who are now in hiding. And uh, during the operation for, you know, when the operation uh, against ISIS started, I was first embedded with Peshmerga in Iraq and then with Iraq Special Operation for a nine months battle to kind of conduct more like ethnographic research to see how those foreign fighters on the ISIS side operate. And also I was able to enter, to being with the operation, right, that was moving, 
to be basically one of the first people to enter uh, ISIS uh, bases, you know, offices, and their safe houses, which actually for, for my research was more beneficial because I was able to find their personal notebooks, something that is like not like documents of ISIS, but something more personal that could tell more about a person who joined. And uh, 17, 18, I spent like a year very deeply embedded with a group of ex-ISIS fighters in hiding their particular uh, subsect of ISIS, so-called chain takfiris, who left ISIS because ISIS was not radical enough for them. It's a very specific issue. We're going to talk about them later. But like they're so weird that basically for others, like I could interview for a couple of days, but those guys had to spend a year. Like, they're weird. So who are those uh, foreign fighters? And you know, media likes to talk about them being uh, all about ideology, and that's not true. So let's see who, uh, how did they end up where they ended up. So to end up where they ended up, there are two sets of decisions. So first, it's to push something, had to push them out of their home country. What is that? Some kind of minor problems, you know, like discrimination at home. We're not going to do anyone any good if we're going to pretend that there are no problems. For example, that Arabs in France don't feel discriminated, that Chechens in Russia don't feel a little bit slightly oppressed. And the same like with Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan and a lot of other people who went to ISIS. But also, some people were actually pushed to ISIS in a sense that they were wanted in their home country. And Syria is the only place that had nothing to do with Interpol. So you could just go there. And I'm not talking about these glorious uh, problems like, you know, he was wanted for defending Islam. Or no, he was wanted for smuggling drugs, stealing car, prostitute, you know, like pimping, and a lot of rape and child molesting. A lot of people uh, were wanted, so, you know, I also, not only, I, I, I know it from interviews, but you could, in many countries, you could check if a person is wanted just by name. So right now, when we check ISIS guys who were caught in Syria and are going to be prosecuted for ISIS, the whole set of other things come up that they were wanted for beforehand. Uh, so that's what, why they left the country, right, their home country. How did they end up in Syria and what put them to Syria specifically? Because, you know, there are many options. You could go to Syria, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, Ukraine. You know, if you want to do something and leave your country to fight. Why Syria? So many people actually went there to help. We are not going to discuss you know, if they're smart, what do they, you know, where are they getting the information from, but they did. They honestly believed so. And we know it, for example, by, even by numbers. A lot of them came there after the chemical attack. When they saw it on TV and they started you know, being worried about that. To find meaning in life. They understood it's their last chance to do something meaningful. For ideological reasons. Of course, some people did think it is kind of jihad. For training. There was the sole goal of getting experience there and, for example, coming back home to, to, to fight their home government. Some Chechen particular units uh, came exactly for this. And all Uyghur uh, units I know about, they, that was their main thing. They, they didn't even like participate in operations where they could be killed. They participated in like training operations. And, of course, for power and money, and those other people, we know, we, we know their faces because guess what? They were all over TV. With like Instagram pictures, with everything. Yeah, because they came for that. So that's what they were doing. What jobs could they be dreaming of doing when they go to a war zone, right? And there's a whole spectrum. We shouldn't just think it's a foreign fighter, right? Just an abstract foreign fighter. There are many things that they could do. For example, starting with very easy moral support. You know, I mean, like we found a lot of a lot of letters from like kids. Uh, we found in Mosul during the operation from kids saying like, "Dear Mujahid, we're so proud of you fighting for you know on a front line. Please be well." It's actually easy support. You know, support our troops. Like in the US, you have this bumper sticker. It's also contribution. They're supporting moral. Then fundraising and sending money. It's two different people because uh, uh, they're not uh, exposing a person who gives money to you know Western Union and tracking. 
recruitment. And I interviewed a person in Istanbul who uh, was part of ISIS, and his job was sending money, you know, buying equipment, drone equipment, and um, moving people to Syria from Istanbul. And he really, really wanted to move to Syria, you know, because you know he's ISIS, he built a country, so he wants to live there and enjoy what he contributes to. And ISIS prohibited him from doing it. They're like, no, 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 we need you to do the job. You're very good at what you're doing right now, so don't come to Syria. So the funny part here is that ISIS failed, and this guy still never had been to actually ISIS territory, and he was very sad about it. But, you know, his job was not this. Like, he had this particular set of job, uh, job description that he was doing. Public relations, on one side we have propaganda that helps support image of the group, abroad, but on the other side we actually have assassinations. Assassinations that are about supporting the image of the group. We almost lost one of uh, people I was interviewing because he, he was in ISIS for three years, foreign fighter from Uzbekistan. Then he left and he, he was disappointed in a group, so he started talking about <coughs> problems in the group openly, I mean openly not on BBC, but uh, openly to the same group of people who could be potential future recruits for ISIS. So of course ISIS was a little bit slightly not happy about it, so they ordered his assassination from Syria, they ordered his assassination in Eastern Europe. They tried to stab him in a cafe, pretending to be like future recruits who want to know more about ISIS. They, you know, he came for to meet them and they tried to stab him. He stabbed them back, so, but you know, everyone is alive. But it's also about controlling the group's image abroad because he was destroying it, so they tried to get rid of him. Then, when you go on a front line, you could take non combat roles, weapons repairing, accounting, musicians, like any, like in any other country, right? Or when you go, uh, you take a military role, you could be a reserve infantry special operations and suicide bombers. And I know that it sounds a little bit like obvious for people, but we need to be very clear, you know, because that's how any army works, right? We have the people on the ground and then a huge tail of logistics. But we often forget about that talking about non-state armed groups. For example, when we're talking about prosecution. We only say, you know, we prosecute, for example, for membership. In Iraq, Iraq prosecuted for membership in a terrorist organization. So without actually looking at what they were doing. So we should not forget that non-state armed groups are similar to actually state armed groups in the sense of different types of jobs people could choose. And as you could imagine, a person, even a foreigner, who comes in to become like a weapon repairer, it's a different person from the person who comes in to join special operation force for all kind of future, you know, problems. Uh, prosecution, reintegration, and so on. It's just two different people. Uh, there are many groups, not that many, many, but several groups that take foreign fighters in, in a conflict, right? So a foreign fighter, when he comes into country, he could choose between all those different groups which one to join. How does he do so? Uh, first, they are looking at uh, personal and family safety. So if a person comes with a family, his first priority is to ensure that his family is safe. For example, in 2000, uh, a lot of foreign fighters came to Syria with Jaish Mohajirin Wansar, very creative name, Army of Foreigners and Locals, top, like creativity on its top. And then this armed group fell apart and some people moved to ISIS and some people moved to Jabhat and Nusra, foreigners from this main foreign fighter group. Uh, so when it was falling apart and, and for, uh, foreign fighters were deciding which group to join, ISIS intentionally spread rumors that there was a particular village where there were Kazakh females living. And when their males went to fight, members, locals, members of Free Syrian Army raped them. Very big thing, it was all over telegram channels, all over the phone, you know, like all foreign fighters were discussing that. Oh my god, like if we have families, we have to go to ISIS because otherwise, you know, like we could not survive here. Uh, it was totally fake. There was no this Kazakh females in this village whatsoever because Jabhat al-Nusra did start an investigation. 
you, to kind of clean the image and also get some foreign fighters. But it was too little, too late. Everyone believed that it was true. There were Kazakh females who were raped, and the only way to save your family is to go to ISIS because it's the only group that's going to protect your family, foreign family. So they won on that. Then, of course, material benefits. Uh, some foreign fighters were more interested in money, so they were looking for an armed group that pays more. Not only like welfare, uh, you know, like cash, but also distribution of loot and some non-money goods. So you would, you know, it's, it's very hard to buy anything in Syria, right, during the war there. So armed groups actually facilitated bringing in some goods, such as diapers. So Jabhat al-Nusra was distributing diapers like every month to the fighters. Why? Because, come on, those fighters have seven kids. Could you imagine living like with five, seven kids and not having access to diapers? So even, you know, so I'm just trying to show that we need to look on a very, like, small level when thinking about that. Uh, groups internal organization, and, you know, you don't want to work for a corrupt boss who is, like, just not a nice person, right? So it's also important when uh, a foreign fighter chooses a group. Prestige, and here we're talking about Al-Qaeda. All foreign fighters want to text home saying, oh my god, like, I'm finally in Al-Qaeda, I'm cool, look at me. So it was a big discussion between ISIS and Jabhat al who is real Al-Qaeda. So you could remember when uh, Mohammed al-Julani went on Al Jazeera, and uh, first time ever, and his main message was like, we're Al-Qaeda. And we were watching it and saying, like, who are you, like, what's the point? Like, we don't care if you're Al-Qaeda, say, probably knows if you're Al-Qaeda or not, so who is your audience here? But that's basically what they were trying to to show inside Syria who is more Al-Qaeda because their recruitment depended on that. And of course goals actually matter. So people who want to fight Assad or people who want to build caliphates to different, to different people. Uh, foreign fighters do quit and leave voluntarily. Why? Very easy when the, the expectations are not met. If a person goes for jihad, comes in, there is full of corruption and power politics. He is disappointed, he's, it's not what he expected, he wants to go home. If a person came in to become rich, and there is absolutely nothing in the middle of the desert, that's, he doesn't want to be there, right? He wants to leave. So this gentleman on the picture, uh, from Kyrgyzstan, Oh, he fought with Jihad al Nusra. He told me a story that he kind of realized that he doesn't want to be in Syria even before he entered it. So he was um, his main idea to go into fight in Syria was to follow a computer game, to be like cool guy wearing weapons and uh, showing off. And he was in already crossing to Syria, and his leader, military leader, called him and asked him to go to the market and buy two bags of carrots. And he was like, why? So um, he's Uzbek, and in Uzbekistan there is a national dish, plov, which uh, is cooked with rice, meat, and carrots. But somehow, the carrots in Syria, they're very small, and they, they, they don't work good with this food. So they were importing those uh, carrots from Turkey. But for a guy who wants, you know, who came there to be a Rambo, Instead of bringing weapons and ammunition, he was traveling with bags of carrots. I mean, this disaster is embarrassing for him. So already there, he kind of thought that that's probably not gonna be like he thinks it will be. So he left in, in four months, in the first possible opportunity to leave. So we looked on a supply side to understand who are those people and what, how they make decisions they make. So let's look at the man side, uh, the side of the armed group. What benefits those fighters could bring to them and what are the uh, problems associated with them. First benefits. Like any expert, you're getting an expensive expert when you need his knowledge and experience you don't have in a home country. Same thing here, military experience, technical experience. I mean, military experience of like strategy, fighting, technical experience, topography, that is also needed in a war zone. And, you know, maybe local people don't have it, especially in a country that didn't experience any type of war before. They really have to rely on a foreign expertise. 
Like bring it, uh, you know, pharma factory somewhere, you know, somewhere like in Ghana, right? There are no experts yet there on this topic, so you bring them abroad to train them. And uh, this picture is from, I was with our special operation forces when we went to the drone factory. I was drone factory in Mosul, and I took those documents, and official language of ISIS was absolutely always Arabic. This is in English. Drone factory. So basically, I mean, everyone who worked in a drone factory was not a local guy. Like the most sophisticated technology place. The network. The same thing in relation to uh, experience in relation to network. So, for example, let's assume I want you to start some kind of an arm group, and I'm telling you, okay, here's the money to buy weapons, go do it. And you would be like, uh, where? How am I supposed? Like, where would I go? Who sells it? S same thing there. You need people who know how this industry works, the black market for weapons, black market for ammunition, and all that stuff. So I interviewed a person, a, who, a very high level Chechen fighter, he was uh, working as a, a weapon smuggler in the second Chechen war, then he went, he was recruited to go um, work for free uh, Syrian army against securing weapon contracts. And then he actually ended up in Ukraine doing the same for Ukrainian government, you know, when the um, West did not have them, but they also had to acquire weapons and ammunition somewhere. Uh, he was for, for Free Syrian Army. He, he told me he was buying weapons from like uh, Egypt, uh, ammunition, and so on. So he was going representing Syri Syrian uh, uh, rebels, uh, negotiating with other governments. Money. Uh, foreign fighters come personally come with a lot of money. So let's assume in Syria, average monthly salary is like forty dollars. This guy comes from France. He's already ha he already has like some thousand dollars in his pocket that he just sold his car moving there. So he, it's it, it's already enough money for him and his unit to, to survive. So they are basically cash. Dedication and loyalty. It's also a benefit that foreign fighters provide. On one side. It's voluntarily because we could see if a person, a foreign fighter, went through all those obstacles to get to Syria in the first place, he's dedicated, right? He, he signaled it to us. On the other side, a foreign fighter compared to a local fighter could not just say, Halas, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm going to go to my family tribe, get back to my agricultural business, and quit. He, would, he needs to be with a group to, to survive. So he would be more dedicated to the group than local because his exit is much harder. And of course, those fighters look good in propaganda. Uh, there's no free lunch. Uh, they come with a lot of problems. Operational problems. Well, they don't speak the same language. There were many casualties in ISIS when two units, stations next to each other, let's say one Russian speaking, the second one French speaking, did fight each other because even if they did have a radio between themselves, well, what language are they going to use there? So by uh, so they're getting incoming fire from God knows where, they start returning fire, and of course they're shooting each other. By the 2016, uh, during the Mosul battle, they actually adopted the UN system. So on the radio, they would give a command in Arabic, then French, then Russian. Um, screening problem. Well, I mean, if you are recruiting so many foreigners, don't be surprised at how those foreigners are spies. Right? Just as easy as that. So when in 2015 those problems started appearing and it was all over ISIS channels that like, oh my god, we think we have spies in our command. Well, yeah. Shocking, right? So foreign fighters, they have this problem. Um, and also, even if it's not their choice to work for a foreign government, if he's a foreign fighter, his family stayed behind. So he has hostages in his home country that, you know, it's not the case probably here or in the West. But I mean, is Europe? No one cares. They could do anything to his family, so he works for them. Uh, those guys, uh, foreign fighters, have problems with local population. Especially since a lot of them came from power. So if they came from power, whom do they want to exercise this power on? Of course, a person who couldn't do anything against them. Which is local civilian, but not even armed. 
Um, because they have this problem with like speaking language, uh, for example, they are they are destroying group cohesion. So if you try to build them saying, okay, you know, we have to mix all of us together, different nationality, mm-hmm. you know, with time they fall apart into ethnic gangs. And official chain of command is like no one cares. That will happen to ISIS. And the strategy problem. It's an example of a strategy problem. I interviewed a, a person from Dagestan, a foreign fighter, and his unit was stationed in Tapka. It's basically always a front line just because Kurds were near it. His military leader of his unit, military commander of his unit, was also from Caucasus. But this guy was very into fighting in Caucasus. He was really like, okay, I'm getting trained here, I need to go back and fight there. And he was participating in a secret battalion of Ahmed Chitayev that was supposed, uh, it was a secret kind of unit that was supposed to go and back and take offices. So this guy, this military leader of this unit in Taupka, was spending 80% of his time training for this thing to, you know, go fight back in mountains in Russia. So his unit in Taupka was like, come on, we have front line, we have tons of problems here, and our commander is training for what again? Where is he? Because they all had, like, it was a difference in, in their goals that led to difference in strategy. So, of course, you know, it was not effective for the unit in Tapka because they didn't have a military leader. So, we talked about who are the people, what organization could do with that. So, next question is how to make them the most effective. And here I'm comparing uh, human resources strategies of two armed groups, ISIS and Jihad al-Nusra. First, because they're fighting in the same country, at the same time, they split from the same organization, meaning that their leadership has the same background. Uh, and they were recruiting from the same pool of local fighters, well, people of Syria, and the same pool of foreign fighters. For example, when Jaish Muhajirin and Wansar fell apart. So my question is, how did we get to the different results of experience with foreign fighters starting from being basically very similar? The issue is that they approached human resources problem very differently. Their HR policies were like absolutely different. Okay, they both claim that they are uh, Al-Qaeda, but like everyone could do it. Foreign fighters could never check. A low level foreign fighter, no, no chance. But then ISIS was offering significantly more money to fighters, significantly. So, Jihad al-Nusra policy was like, we know that it's enough $50 per month, it's enough to live here. Here is your $50. ISIS was saying, okay, you're, uh, we're going to give you money depending on how much, or on the loot, depending on how many kids you have, uh, here are other benefits, here is a car, and so on. Uh, then ISIS, on top of that, that they were offering a lot, they were taking absolutely everyone. I mean, you could breathe good enough, welcome. Absolutely everyone. Uh, Jihad al-Nusra was extremely selective. I, I personally interviewed a person who came to see, uh, who came to border uh, Turkish border to cross to Syria to go to Jihad al-Nusra, and Jihad al-Nusra didn't take him. They conducted an interview with him and said, you know, dude, like you either go home or you go to ISIS. They were very careful whom they're taking. They were they wanted to make sure that the goals of the foreign fighter are the same as the goals of the organization. Uh, when foreign fighters were inside, Japan, uh, ISIS wanted to, uh, they wanted to integrate them all, to basically have a mixed leadership. So, you know, Iraqi on top, then Saudi, then Russian, then French. Jihad and Nusra, absolutely different. They said, okay, we're Jihad and Nusra, we are sitting here, you know, we are basically Syrian group. All foreign groups should be separate by ethnicity, and they would be affiliated with us, but we would basically meet in only in an operation room when we are preparing for operation. In, term, in terms of internal organization, they are technically not with us. They are like our neighbors, but they are not integrated into our leadership structure. And they actually even place them on some kind of a mountain so they don't interact much with locals. Uh, and in terms of turnover, ISIS great policy, no one could ever leave. Jihad al-Nusra, if you want to leave, here's your bus ticket. Please go. And it, it led to absolutely different result. Uh, ISIS, 
Japan uh, in terms of uh, money. Japanese didn't spend anything on foreign fighters because they were living separately. They were in several several ethnic groups that were doing fundraising themselves. So the only way they could ask, for example, Japata Nostra for money support was during the operation for ammunition, that if they were participating together. That's it. Everything else in terms of finance and budget was absolutely separate. Well, ISIS had very expensive foreign fighters. I mean, those guys were demanding more and more every day, including Yazidi slaves. So Yazidi slave was also one of the bonuses that were basically invented to satisfy ever-growing demands of foreign fighters. Um, of course, ISIS foreign fighters abuse civilians because not only because people who joined for power they mostly went to ISIS because it's cool, but also because ISIS was a colossal organization, so those people could hide behind the flag. So imagine a conflict between some poor local guy in Mosul and some ISIS foreign fighter in, in a restaurant. So, you know, this guy could abuse this poor local, and where would this local go to complain? To ISIS? Well, it's not going to be effective at all. While, for example, in Idlib under Jabhat al-Nusra, if, let's say, a person from Caucasus did something bad to uh, to a local, this local knows that ah, Caucasus people they are from uh, they are from Ajnat al Kafkas. So he would go to Ajnat al Kafkas. It's a small group, you know. This guy who did something bad, he wouldn't hide inside. He would have to answer for what he did. So they would abuse much less. Also control. So ISIS very soon lost control of their um, foreign foreign fighter now gangs, ethnical gangs. So there were infightings between different ethnic groups with casualties. Uh, no problems in Japan and uh, The same thing with, uh, with spying problems. So inside ISIS, because everyone was involved everywhere on all dimensions, they could spy, they could provide all kinds of information. In Japan and Nostra, foreigners got only need to know access to information. They had no idea how Japan and Nostra operates inside because the only thing that they would come together in the operation room preparing for the operation. So they would know only, you know, to, tomorrow tactical intelligence. That's it. Uh, uh, ISIS had counterproductive uh, military strategies while uh, in Japan and Nostra there were no disagreements about targets and also for example when they were coming to military operation room to talk about to prepare for tomorrow operation they would they would be representative of, uh, of all those ethnic groups and they would ask them okay guys like tomorrow we plan to do this and this go this and this uh, you know take this town or village do you want to participate so participation of ethnic groups in this operation was voluntarily and um, with regard, for example, the group of Ashnath and Kafkas, which is people from like Chechens, Dagestan, is from Caucasus, they always volunteered to be a leading group in operations when there was a confirmed intelligence that on the other side there were Russian troops, like Russian, Russian. I mean, because that's what they came there for, you know, they hate Russian more than they hated Assad, just because they suffered under Russian government. The same thing with Saudi group. Saudi guys volunteered when the, there was a confirmed in, volunteered to lead the operation, the most dangerous uh, operation, uh, when there was a confirmed intelligence that uh, Iranian ground troops were on the other side. But that basically makes the whole operation more effective because what's the point to send people who don't want to fight Assad on the front line? I mean, they're not going to be as effective as sending people who really want to fight him. So we, took, uh, we talked about actually average fighters, like normal fighters, Th those were normal. There is a particular, very complicated, another problem. Some people joined for ideological reasons. Small group actually, extremely small, but they are the most problematic for an armed group. Why? because they put ideology in front of military and organizational necessity. What does it mean? It means that it goes counterproductive for strategy and organization, which is what? Which is negative for an armed group, right? So, for example, what this is in, in Syria, in, in this jihad kind of world, they are, it's a, they're called chain takfiris. I mean, nickname, I don't know if it's official or not. They're following a couple of shakes. Um, 
they, uh, and ISIS was taken then because ISIS was taken everyone. So those people, for example, their military complaint to ISIS leadership was uh, the most successful ISIS strategy was to put Iraqi military uniform on, put a fake checkpoint, stop the cars, kill everyone. Super successful, like really. The problem was that those guys, the ideological guys, they found somewhere the following quote, if you look like one, you're the one. So, and according to that quote, their interpretation of this quote, for example, that, that operation, those operations were not acceptable. Because it makes a person who takes a Iraqi military uniform, puts Iraqi military uniform on, kafir, non, non-Muslim. So those guys went to ISIS leadership and said that we need to prohibit those operations because they're against Islam. Like, could you imagine a face of you know ISIS military leadership when some you know like weird guy comes in and says, by the way, your most effective strategy, no, 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 it's against Islam. She's like, die. <laughs> like, no. We have to, you know, we have to work to do here and not do with your like crazy ideas. The same thing with local populations. When ISIS was working extremely hard to make you know, peace with tribes without whom they could not survive. Those guys, they came so f- they, they went so far that they, they, they found somewhere that the females in, in uh, Iraq and Syria, they don't like to breastfeed. Like it's not, they're using formal milk, like powder milk. Well, that happens. But the problem is that those guys, uh, they, according to them, according to Islam, a female has to breastfeed for two years. <coughs> yeah, and this was an issue they addressed to ISIS leadership as, a, as one of the points to declare local population non-Muslims. Could you, like, I really sympathize with ISIS leadership here. Just because they really feel, look more sane. <laughs> Because those guys, they were putting, again, the ideological ideas up front from all other. Second, those guys were not afraid to die, which is a disaster, because then they, they, they could go against ISIS leadership, for example, without being afraid to die. It's a very dangerous opposition. And because it's inside their head, you could not identify who those are very easy. I mean, think about U.S. fighting McCarthy and you know the USSR problems with Trotsky. You could not look at the person's head. So those guys are very dangerous. It's an extremely dangerous fifth column inside your organization. And you don't know who is a little off and when he goes a little off. Because he could snap like any minute, basically. So ISIS and Jihad and Nusra had very different strategies of dealing with them. Those are this group of people, this weird group of people I had to spend a year with because they were like, they're super complicated. ISIS, how did ISIS approach it? Like any dictatorship, we need to catch them and kill them all. Well, it worked so well, like always. So where they ended up? They ended up with internal war. It was a total dictatorship because they don't know whom they're catching. They were like running after ghosts. And because they were basically imprisoning everyone, everyone was spying on everyone, they had to take their best people from the Battle of Kabane on the front line to bring them in to work for Amnia, which is ISIS internal security force, to catch those guys whom they don't even know who they are. Well, I mean, operation imminent success. Well, Jabhat al-Nusra did a very clever thing. Jabhat al-Nusra, first they were screening on those uh, ideological people. They were not taking them. But, you know, it's related to religion, and you don't know when a person could, you know, in war zone, you don't know when he could start, you know, overthinking religion and go there, right? So he could come in with the goal of money and then uh, get a little off. So you need a constant screening for that. So what did Jabhat al-Nusra do? They, had a, they constructed a fake armed group called Jund al-Aqsa. It's an absolutely bizarre armed group. So like, if something really weird was happening in Idlib, you know it's Jund al-Aqsa. Like bombing some civilian bosses. Like, why? 
uh, this group was everyone hated it. All groups in uh, on uh, FSA hated them because they were doing all these random things, going against the Harar Sham, being like two and a half people. Like, no, the Harar Sham is like sixty thousand. Like, why would you do it? And everyone wanted them to wanted to close them, to get rid of them. But Chapadanos was always protecting them. No, no, no. Like we're going to take care of those people. Why would they need this Jundalaksa group to be a magnet? for those crazy guys. So switching between Jundalaksa or between Japatanus and Jundalaksa was I mean absolutely totally free. So the minute you want to go to Jundalaksa, be my guest, you know, just please go. So they made the fake arm group with this kind of weird ideology that everyone who was like going that way, they could just go. Nice, easy, clean, everyone is happy. But there is no, no jihadist goes wasted. So for a long time, suicide bombers of Jabhat al-Nusra operations, they came not from Jabhat al-Nusra. They came from Jund al-Aqsa. They were taking suicide uh, bombers from this off group, from this mental hospital over there. Uh, I mean, super successful. Not only they didn't waste them, they made the best use of them. So basically, uh, we could stop here just uh, to summarize how to, you know, just guys in case you want to run an armed group of foreign fighters. Let me give you a couple of advice. Uh, be very careful on the goals that those guys come in with. They, you should be like checking that. So it, it matches the goal of your group. Then total segregation. Those guys need to live somewhere outside and be ethnically segregated like how the French was French. Saudi was Saudi, Russians was Russians. Uh, the same with uh, in terms of finances. Uh, always they need to have po total freedom to leave. I mean, why would you keep uh, people who are not happy with you? I mean, you're just inviting problems. Um, and uh, very carefully identifying and separating those uh, guys who put ideology in front of military necessity. And here we're talking about you know jihadist groups. I mean, communist, same thing with communist. Basically, any ideology, there could be such people that they need to be, you know, taken out before that spreads. Because those guys do the lot, so they technically recruit more and more people. So if you don't take care of that as early as possible, you're in a big problem. In Derzor, uh, Chetafidis did a coup, so they were actually running Derzor for some time. Like that's how bad it went. I guess we're going to stop here. Thanks. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Vera Marinova, for a very fascinating talk. So thank you very much. Interesting.